What's up guys and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil and today we're talking about Dark Season 3 Episode 2 titled The Survivors. This video will of course have spoilers through Season 3 Episode 2 but that's as far as I've watched into the season so no spoilers for the rest of the season. Overall, I continue to love this show and I'm so bummed that it's coming to an end. What struck me most about this episode is how well Dark is able to balance character development and sci-fi intrigue. Some scenes are dedicated purely, for example, to exploring Trant Nielsen's family drama. Other scenes are dedicated to delving into the Sigmundus mythology and its origins, but both are interesting and everything in the show has a solid through line of emotion running through it. So I haven't seen anything quite like this in the past and I'm really going to miss this show. But without further ado, let's jump into the details of the episode and I'll break it down year by year and character by character to kind of keep track of everything. Also, I should know everything we saw in this episode, I'm assuming, took place in our world, with the exception of the final scene between Jonas and the older Marta. Starting out in 1888, our world, Marta wakes up, older Jonas is there waiting for her, holding the letter that supposedly came from Marta. He introduces her to Bartosz, Magnus, and Francisca, they're excited to see her until Marta explains again that she is not from their world. She is not their Marta. And then she says, I promise to make everything right again so none of it happens. In that moment, I really feel the tragedy of her character because it seems that she and Jonas are fated to over and over fight to erase all the horrible things that have happened and you get the feeling that they've gone through this cycle so many times how many times have we heard younger Jonas say this older Jonas and older older Jonas as Adam so you just feel that endless fight against something that seems unstoppable and I particularly felt it here when Marta tearfully tells them She's trying to do the same thing. Then there's a really interesting moment where Jonas asks Marta how she knew about them. And she claims that Jonas told her where to find them. Jonas says, you're lying. I never went to your world. And she claims that Jonas went to her world and told her about them. So like I said, Jonas accuses her of lying. He asks if Adam sent her and asked how she traveled, what did she travel with. And then an older man, an older blind man shows up who we later learn is an older townhouse. Now the reason I found that line so fascinating is because throughout the series it's never been clear if we're ever seeing something that deviates from a previous cycle. They keep telling us you really can't change the past, maybe you can tweak it here and there, but it seemed like everything that's occurred in the series so far Older Jonas remembers. If younger Jonas does something, older Jonas remembers it, meaning younger Jonas is simply going along the predetermined path that has already occurred in a previous cycle. This appears to be the very first super clear, not questionable example of the past being altered because younger Jonas told Marta where to find them. Older Jonas doesn't remember it. My theory at the moment, and I'm sure this will evolve over the next six episodes, is that it takes 33 years for the world to sort of reset itself. So for example, a certain set of events occurred which the older Jonas remembers. Young Jonas can deviate from that path, and older Jonas can continue to exist remembering his version of events. But eventually there will be a sort of reset where this new cycle catches up and becomes the status quo, where this older Jonas will be replaced with a version of older Jonas that recalls the new path that the current iteration of younger Jonas followed. But I'm sure a lot of you that have already binged season three, you already know if I'm right or wrong about that. So we'll find out. Later, Bartosz visits Marta and apologizes for Jonas's behavior. He says that Jonas has been acting differently ever since they arrived in 1888. He goes on to explain that they ended up here by accident in 1888, and they are out of nuclear fuel, which is kind of hard to come by in that day and age. So they're stranded there. 
Bartosz then takes Marta to the Sigmundus lair and explains a little bit more about what's going on. Meanwhile, Older Townhouse asks Jonas if Marta is one of them, one of these travelers. And he can tell Jonas is very upset by the arrival of this visitor. So he tells him, don't forget what we're creating, a paradise. And then we see on his cane a very familiar phrase. And he says it out loud, Sigmundus Creatus Est. So we begin to realize that this is where it all started. This is the beginning of the Sigmundus cult. And seeing how cold Jonas is, you can start to see his transformation into Adam, into the villain. It sort of reminded me of Star Wars back in the day, seeing Jake Lloyd play a young Anakin and then Hayden Christensen playing the middle-aged Anakin. So Jake Lloyd is young Jonas, Hayden Christensen is middle-aged Jonas, and both Anakin and Jonas turn into a very scarred, bald, older gentleman. So uh, some definite parallels there, but I think Dark is doing it way better. It is very believable. The transformation of the innocent young Jonas we saw at the beginning of the series. At first, you wonder how in the world can he turn into what seems to be evil Adam, and it's totally believable the way they're doing it. So back to Bartosz and Marta in the Sigmundus lair. Bartosz explains that the older man, the blind man, is an older townhouse. His father thought that they could break the rules of space and time. He was essentially trying to build a time machine. This townhouse that we see here is carrying on his father's work. Jonas has seen this secret Sigmundus lodge in a future time, and Jonas is trying to rebuild things the way he saw them. And then Bartosz asks Marta who Adam is, and Marta reveals that Adam is Jonas. So Jonas apparently did not tell his friends who Adam is and the fact that he grows up to become Adam. I'm sure that will be a source of some strife in the group, and it'll be a pretty interesting conflict to see it play out. And the implication here is that Adam, Francisca, and Magnus have been hanging out here since 1888 and became the versions of them we saw in 1921 when Jonas was visiting Adam. But big question mark here, what happens to Bartosz in that time? He is one of the few characters where we have not been given a glimpse into his future. Does he die? Does he become a character where we don't know he is that older character? Has Adam been lying? Maybe Bartosz is Adam. I don't think it's going that way, but with this show, you never know. At the same time, what we saw of 1921 may not be a done deal. Like I alluded to earlier, I think we may be seeing a break from the previous cycles. And Adam kept talking about a loophole. Is the other world, the existence of this alternate reality, the loophole he was referring to? Marta's arrival in 1888, does that deviate them from the predetermined path? And does that mean Jonas might not become Adam and Sigmundus may not become what it does in our cycle? That's everything we see in 1888, so let's jump to 1987 and check in on Katarina. At the end of Season 2, we saw her crawl into the cave and go back in time in search of Mikkel. It turns out she hasn't been able to find him. She's in the Conwald residence, but Ines and Michael slash Mikkel are missing. Now, I never get sick of seeing characters delve into time travel for the first time, explore the past, bump into their younger self. It's especially fun to see how Dark will play within the boundaries, because generally speaking, when a character goes back in time, they're not going to do anything that alters what we've already seen in the present. So it's really fun to see how they play within those boundaries. Katarina goes to school and starts handing out flyers of a missing Michael Conwald looking for her son. She bumps into younger Ulrich, and he mentions the madman, and he says maybe he got him after all. Then Katarina bumps into her younger self and Hannah. Hannah reveals a little bit more information and explains that a madman, who we know is older Ulrich, escaped from an institution and went after Michael. 
Then she coldly tells Hannah to keep her hands off Ulrich and Mikkel. I have to say, I felt kind of bad for Hannah here. As much as she is a manipulative and horrible person in certain ways, she is just a child here, and she's being essentially attacked by someone who's been harboring anger that's been growing for 30 years and imposing it on her, so felt bad for her in that moment. Then Katarina heads to the police station and pesters one of the cops there trying to get some information. In the police station, we see a flyer, by the way, calling for witnesses on Egon's death and a missing persons poster for Claudia. So Katarina begs the cop, he's reluctant, clearly she's bugged him before, and he finally gives her a little kernel of information saying that Ines and Michael Conwald are essentially in hiding, Child Protective Services knows where they are, and the madman that Katarina asks about is in the closed ward where he's been for 34 years. So Katarina heads to the institution in search of Ulrich and begs the woman behind the counter to let her in to see Ulrich. That woman, by the way, is Katarina's mother, Helena. At first, Helena refuses until Katarina points out the necklace that Helena is wearing that is the necklace of St. Christopher. Katarina says, my mom had one just like it. I've traveled a long way. That seems to rattle something in Helena, and she gives. She lets Katarina go in to see Ulrich. And they have a brief interaction. Ulrich is, of course, very upset. And Katarina promises Ulrich that she'll get him out of there. Ulrich is such a heartbreaking and tragic figure, and I'm so curious to see what the conclusion will be to his character arc. We don't know a lot about his internal mental state when he is this older version of himself. We know he has still very much held on to that anger towards Egon, but how does he look back on the way he treated Katarina and Hannah? Is he apologetic? Does he regret it? Has he become a better person? That's what I'm wondering, and I would love to see him get some sort of redemption because he has just been such a tragic figure, and you've got to know how horrible and awful his life has been these 33 years being separated from his son. And of course, the St. Nicholas Medal is an important one because Jonas and Marta found it by the lake. Marta turned it into a necklace, which she gave Jonas, and older Jonas put it on Marta's pillow to let her know that he has returned after disappearing in 2019. And then we see Adam holding on to that necklace. So I'm wondering how Marta's grandmother got a hold of it. Or did Marta's grandmother somehow hand it down and it ended up at the lake? Or is there some kind of a time loop where Marta in the future gives it to Helena? I'm sure we will find out later in the season. Then Helena returns home and she is somewhat abusive. We know that she gave Katarina as a teenager some bruises after she had that difficulty with Ulrich when Hannah falsely reported to the police that Ulrich forced himself on Katarina. So Helena smacks young Katarina on the back of the head and tells her to clear the table. So as always, Dark does a great job of giving us sort of double character development where we're following older Katarina while also learning more about her younger self and how she became the hardened individual that can really take care of herself that she is now. Now let's stay in 1987, but check in on Trant and Jana. They are at Mad's funeral where they're burying an empty coffin. While there, Jana sort of makes a scene by telling everyone that Trant was having an affair with Claudia the night that Mads disappeared. She also points out Trant's current obsession with tracking down Claudia, who, of course, disappeared the day her father died. We know that she transported herself to 2020 to ride out the apocalypse in the bunker. This show does such a fantastic job of taking characters who are minor at first and then delving into them to add a ton of depth. 
For example, Claudia and Egon weren't very prominent in the first season, but took center stage in season two, added a lot more depth to those characters. And now we're doing the same thing for Janna and especially Trant. And I'll shout out a few moments that I thought worked emotionally really well for Trant. So Trant, in his search for Claudia, goes to speak to her assistant, Jasmine, and asks if she noticed anything strange about Claudia in the week before she disappeared. Jasmine reveals that Claudia was a very well put together, well dressed person, but in that week, sometimes she wore the same outfit twice and she was sort of starting to fall apart. Everything changed, she said, when the older woman showed up with the dog. And strangely, the older woman, we know that's an older Claudia, said that the dog was hers, but left the dog behind when she left. Now, I love that attention to detail. I love the fact that Jasmine noticed her Claudia saying that the dog is hers and then leaving it behind. I feel like other shows and movies wouldn't give their characters that much intelligence and that much attention to detail. And that is just something I love about this show. Sometimes on shows like Lost, for example, it would feel like to some degree the mystery was maintained because characters wouldn't ask the right questions, even though we know in real life we would definitely ask those questions. So it feels like Dark just isn't cheating and it treats us intelligently and I love that. Then Trant is driving along and he sees Regina, Claudia's daughter, with Claudia's dog, and he offers to give her a ride. While they're driving, Trant asks Regina if Claudia said anything about him before she disappeared. And Regina said no, and then Trant kind of distantly says, I just thought maybe she'd said something. Then Regina gets uncomfortable, asks him to drop her off, and she'll walk the rest of the way. He says, if you need anything. Again, this is a moment where I thought they did a great job of adding depth to Trant's character and it bringing this sense of tragedy to him. When he finds out that Claudia didn't say anything about him before disappearing, I think he's starting to realize that Claudia intentionally left. She wasn't kidnapped or anything like that. And he wasn't really on her mind before she disappeared. So a tragic and sad moment for him. I also think this is the moment where he decides, I'm going to go be with Jana and rededicate myself to my family. That night, Claudia's assistant Jasmine is closing up for the night when she is paid a visit by the lip-scarred trio and they very creepily surround her before killing her. The middle-aged version of the man says, hell is empty and all the devils are here. A line very similar to one from Dawn of the Dead, where they say, when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. This guy, the lip scarred man, is such a great villain. He's so creepy, the way they'll sort of synchronize their movements, crossing their arms, surrounding Jasmine. I don't know if we've ever seen this concept done in this way before. The idea of three iterations of the same person very creepily working together from different times works very well. And his motivations at this point are very unclear. My only guess is that they come from the other world and they're working with the older Marta in a similar capacity as Noah works with the older Jonas or Adam. But what exactly they're doing is not yet clear. Back home, Trant sees Janna and Janna says, at some point you need to decide for us or for them. And Janna wonders aloud, without saying it exactly, if Trant is Regina's father. And it's unspoken, but all but confirmed, that Trant is Regina's father, who he fathered with Claudia. He tells Janna, you're right, I have to choose, then takes her hand and seems to decide that he is going to stick with Janna. And of course, during the montage, we get a split screen shot of Trant and Janna on one side, and Mads on the other. This show, especially during these montages, is so good at breaking your heart. And I just have to shout out again how great a job it does at blending human drama with just fascinating science fiction. Bravo to Dark. Now, fast forward, still in our world, 
to a post-apocalyptic wind-in in 2020, starting with Claudia. We see Claudia taking care of Regina, trying to help her survive through her cancer. Then we see her putting her board together. So we've seen the board that she keeps in the bunker with the pictures of all of the townsfolk, how they're all connected. And we've seen this wall before back in season two. We've seen the older Claudia looking at it in the bunker. I have to say, by the way, we've seen this trope before in other shows where characters are trying to crack a case wide open and they put all the newspaper articles and pictures on a big wall connect them with string and they always wonder if that would actually help this is the one show where 100 percent it would help and make sense because it's so hard to keep straight the complicated family trees especially when you introduce the concept of time travel when I was doing my recap for the first couple seasons of Dark, I essentially had to put together my own similar board. So it definitely helps. And by the way, I do want to just quickly plug, I did put together an epic two-hour super detailed recap of seasons one and two of Dark. If you need a reminder of everything that happened before season three, and I'd highly recommend it because it makes it so much easier to spot the Easter eggs and just keep track of what's going on. So I'll throw a link in the description and a card in the corner of the screen if you want to check out that big recap. Anyway, Claudia, we see her leaving a recording, the one that Jonas heard in 2053, where she says that the God particle, if stabilized, could be a way to travel back in time and save everyone. While Claudia is away, Trant pays a visit to his daughter, Regina. And then he says, I'm so sorry, but it has to happen. She said it's the only way to save you. And then he takes a pillow and suffocates and kills his own daughter. As if Trant's character wasn't tragic enough, knowing that his lover has disappeared, his daughter is estranged from him. Now, decades later, without reconciling with her, he needs to kill his own daughter. And the she in question that told him he has to do this, I'm assuming is the older Claudia. We know that the older Claudia has come to believe that events need to play out exactly as they did in the previous cycle so that everything can be reset and things can be done in a better way where everybody lives happily ever after, I'm assuming. But we, I'm assuming, will learn more about her master plan. That is just about it for Regina and Claudia this episode. So let's stay in 2020 post-apocalypse and check in with Peter and Elizabeth. Peter takes Elizabeth to the containment site. They're there to see if Charlotte or Francisca have been found. Also, Noah is creepily following them. Inside the containment site, they look at a board with images of all the dead bodies that have been found. We see Wooler with his one eye. We see Clausen, but we don't see Francisca or Charlotte. So Peter takes that to mean it's possible that his wife and daughter, Elizabeth's mother and sister, could still be alive. We, of course, know that Elizabeth's sister, Francisca, is stranded in the late 1800s, and her mother slash daughter, Charlotte, is in 2053. Peter and Elizabeth head back to the Conwald household, where Peter, scanning with his Geiger counter, decides to check things upstairs. While he's upstairs, Noah shows up and starts talking to Elizabeth. Noah tells Elizabeth that he's looking for food, he asks her what she's looking for, and she writes on a piece of paper, she's looking for mom and sister. Then she asks Noah where he's sleeping. He writes down, cave. Elizabeth holds on to that note, and it seems to take on some meaning for her. Then Peter shows up and tells Noah to leave and to stay away from them. Noah tells Peter, you want to protect her, I know, so do I, and I will after you were killed. Very cruel line from Noah here. He is the one character, well, one of the few characters where I really haven't felt much sympathy for him. Maybe a pang of sympathy when he visits Charlotte last season and sees how awful she thinks he is. 
Charlotte says to him, you killed the children. And he basically explains, I hope one day you'll understand I had to do that so I could create a reality where I didn't do that. He's following the similar line of thinking as the older Claudia. I need to do all these horrible things so one day we can essentially reset into a better world. So maybe I started to feel a little sympathy for him, but then he says something awful like that to Peter after you were killed, meaning it's a done deal, you are destined to die. And that is just awful, and I feel very bad for Peter there. Later, Elizabeth asks Peter what Noah said to him. He doesn't reveal it. She gets frustrated, saying she's not a kid anymore, demands to know why Peter carries that Triketra notebook around with him everywhere. Where is my mom? Where is Francisca? They shove each other, and Peter tries to comfort her by saying, we'll find them. And again, just very sad to see Peter trying so hard to care for Elizabeth, knowing he probably doesn't have much time left. And during the montage, Elizabeth is holding that piece of paper that says mom and sister cave the notes she exchanged back and forth with Noah. Like I said, I think it's taken on some meaning for her and it plants the seeds for the relationship that we know is going to occur between Elizabeth and Noah, the one that ultimately produces Charlotte. Speaking of whom, fast forward to 2053, Charlotte is looking at a photograph of Elizabeth and Noah holding Charlotte as a baby, a photo we've seen before. And I'm assuming by this point, Charlotte knows the truth and is still trying to process it all. The truth being that Elizabeth is both her daughter and her mother. Elizabeth and Charlotte have a quiet moment together where Elizabeth says everything will be okay. Charlotte puts her head against Elizabeth's to sort of comfort her. And that's a similar gesture we saw back in season one where Elizabeth does the same thing to Charlotte before Elizabeth goes missing for a little bit. Now that's everything we see from our world in this episode. Let's jump over to Marta's world. So we're in older Marta's lair, sort of her take on the Sigmundus lair. We see a painting of Adam and Eve, and I am just waiting for the revelation that older Marta goes by the name Eve. I'm assuming we're going to get that, but we'll see. Older Marta explains to Jonas that the world ends in both of their worlds. Things might not happen the same way or at the same time, but they happen. And speaking of not happening at the same time, she reveals that the apocalypse takes place on her world in just three days. So that's about seven months early compared to our world. In our world, the apocalypse hit in June 2020. It looks like in their world, it hits November 2019, shortly after the night Mikkel didn't disappear on their world. Anyway, that about wraps it up for episode two of Dark. I love this show. I thought this was another great episode. And I kind of hate the fact that they released the whole season at once because as much as I want to pace myself and watch it over the course of weeks, I know I'm not going to be able to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and binge the show. But in between every episode, I'll come back here and give you my recap, give you my thoughts. So make sure if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we release one of these videos. And I should also note that, like I said, we'll be doing these pre-recorded reviews after each episode, but it will all culminate once we've finished the season, we're going to do a live stream. So make sure you're subscribed so you can join the live stream. Be part of the conversation where we try to hash out everything we saw, break down our theories, our favorite moments of the show, you won't want to miss it. And by the way, I keep saying I'm going to be so bummed once this show is over. Dark was created by a filmmaker named Baron Bo Odar, who's done a few movies that were pretty well received in Germany. Once we get through Dark, I do plan to dive into his film library. So that's just one more reason why you'll want to make sure you're subscribed so you can follow along as we follow everything else this guy's done and we'll follow whatever he does in the future because I've got to assume whatever he does after dark will also be awesome. So with that, I'll just say thanks for watching and see you on the next One Take.